us to the book of Exodus, chapter number 12. And we're going to read a few portions of Scripture until you hear in this morning. And uh, preach a while as the Lord will allow. Exodus chapter 12. Again, I read with verse number one. If you have it, say amen. 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 Believe you there. And the word of the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb in house and if the household be too little for the lamb let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls every man according to his eating shall you make your count for the lamb your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats and you shall keep it unto the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening and they shall take of the blood and strike it upon the two posts and the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unliving bread and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden it all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain unto the morning and that which remaineth of it unto the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. I want to preach if the Lord will help me. Amen. In, in all of these verses, you find that the lamb as it pertains to the Passover. And I want to preach if the Lord will help me on the answer is still the lamb. The answer is still the land. We prayed, amen, over this message. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. In Exodus, we see the judgment of God as it is poured out on the land of Egypt. And you know with, yeah, if you have much Bible knowledge at all of the story of Moses and the ten plagues that befall the land of Egypt. The number ten is significant in Bible numerology. It represents the fullness of Quantity. We know that there are ten commandments which represents the fullness of God's expression of moral law, of justice and judgments. And we know that the ten plagues that were on the, the land of Egypt, that represents the completeness of the plagues. The land uh, of Egypt was completely covered by these ten plagues. Now as I, I began to study for this message, I, I found something very interesting. You may have already known this, but... We, when we read of the ten plagues, we just read of the frogs and the, the lice and the hail and, uh, and uh, the water coming to blood. But I, I did not realize that every single one of these plagues had a deeper meaning because it touched on the gods of Egypt. Because every single one of these plagues that happened, uh, it correlated with a god uh, that was in Egypt. Uh, we know the first plague was the, the water being turned unto blood. The Egyptians had a god happy, which was the, the god of the Nile. Uh, amen. And when that water was turned to blood, it was Jehovah saying, I'm greater than happy. Heket that was the Egyptian god of fertility, of, of renewal. And that Egyptian god and their paganism had the head of a frog. And when all of the frogs came upon the land of Egypt and they died and there was a stench, it was Jehovah saying, I'm greater than happy. Amen. You can go through each one. Geb uh, was the God of the dust of the earth. Uh, amen. Out of that came uh, the locust. Uh, the Egyptian God of creation, the movement of sun, the rebirth well, was the name Kephri, which was uh, symbolized by a fly, which was the plague of the flies. Hathor, 
the Egyptian goddess of love and protection. She had the head of a cow. And we know that there was a plague that resulted in the death of the cattle and the livestock. You could go on and on with this. Amen. The goddess of medicine was Isis. Amen. And we know that bowls and sores came upon the, the bodies of the Egyptians that they had no cure for. A nut. And I can tell you, he was a nut. You may get that in a minute. Amen. He was the God of the sky. Amen. And hell rained down from the sky in the form of fire. Saith the Egyptian God of storms and disorder. Amen. The, the, uh, the locusts that covered the sky. Ra was outside of Pharaoh who they worshipped as their God. Ra was the greatest God of Egyptian culture. They worshipped that sun God. Amen. But Jehovah. Amen. Through his men, uh, Moses and Aaron, they spoke. Uh, and that sun was completely turned to darkness, uh, signifying that God uh, is greater than Ra. Yeah. Amen. Ra is no match for God in all of these plagues. Uh, through nine of these plagues. Uh, amen. We, can, we know the story of the judgment and the Passover that I'm preaching to you uh, this morning. Uh, but in all leading up to this, uh, I've had people ask, uh, Amen, how could your God that is a love, a uh, God of love, of mercy and grace, uh, how is it that He could send a death angel and, and brutally kill people, the firstborn uh, of the Egyptians? Uh, amen. I, I just have to tell them that leading up to this, yes, uh, God God is a God of grace, mercy, and love. He's also a God of judgment. Also a just God, a jealous God. But in every one of these plagues, nine different times grace was being extended. Nine different times. Amen. God was extending grace saying, I am greater. I'm greater than your gods. He picked out nine of the greatest gods in Egyptian religion and proved to them once and for all that he was greater with every plague, with every sign, with every passing day. God in his infinite love and mercy was showing grace, preaching that there is a different way. There is a greater way. There is a better way. He's saying and screaming that the I am, amen, is greater than any God created by men. Amen. We look at this. Amen. How would you respond to that if I saw all of these signs? Amen. And God was revealing His grace and His mercy. I think that I would open up my eyes and my heart and I would listen to what He had to say. I think that I would uh, set aside my presuppositions and I would set aside my preconceived notions and I would say, God, you, you must be trying to show me something when all of the nine gods that I worship, they've all crashed and burned. Uh, amen. And there's, there's no help for us in this situation. Uh, you've got my attention. But instead, their hearts were hardened. Their hearts turned to stone. I mean, their hearts, I mean, were not softened and, 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 and given over to God, but their, their hearts were hardened and they became bitter, amen, toward God that was dealing with them. Amen, God was showing them grace. God was dealing with them. Just like in our generation. Amen, how many in this world has God dealt with? God has shown mercy, 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 grace. Grace, grace, and instead of uh, instead of submitting to the pulling of the spirit, they resist to the tug of the spirit. They resist the conviction that comes their way. There's no difference. You, you look at the story and you say, "How foolish could the Egyptians be to to see that God is greater?" And yet they harden their heart. I mean, how foolish is it for a man or a woman to be under conviction time after time after time? And God's dealing with that heart, dealing with them. But instead of running to an altar, they run out the back door. Amen. I, I can tell you, there's no difference than the Egyptian and how. They responded to God uh, and how the lost man resisting the tug of conviction responded to him. Uh, there is no difference. God said, Amen, nine times I've dealt with them. It's time. Amen, for the final act of judgment. Folks, I can tell you the end can be found in the beginning. Amen, the end can be found in the There's so many striking parallels into the story. 
Amen. We see that uh, throughout God's mercy, God's grace, God was dealing. Uh, their hearts were hardened and he turned to a final act of judgment. Uh, I can tell you through the ages of time since Calvary, God uh, has been dealing with the hearts of men. Uh, God, his long suffering. Uh, amen. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's dealing with men, uh, dealing with our hearts. Uh, but you hear me, you can resist long enough. Uh, amen. That there will be a final act act of judgment. Uh, there is going to be a final act of judgment on this world. Uh, there's not a politician that can stop it. Uh, there's not a world leader that can prevent it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the heart of the king is in the Lord's hands. Uh, everything that's happening in this world uh, is a running at breakneck speed to the judgment uh, of God Almighty. His word uh, is forever settled in heaven. You read uh, the book of Revelation, the book uh, of the apocalypse. Uh, there's no Nothing that man can do to stop it. Uh, amen. This world uh, is headed for judgment. I know. Donald Trump saying, you elect me, I will stop World War III and I hope he does. But you hear me, he can delay it. But he ain't going to stop it. There is going to be a global war in this world. Amen, the kingdom. Amen, of this world is going to be a war. There, this world is headed for judgment. The same way there was a final act of judgment coming that was going to grip all the land of Egypt, there is a final act of judgment coming. Amen, to this world. Amen, there, there's just going to be one more difference between that judgment and the judgment that's to come for this world. You see, the judgment in Exodus, it was still mingled with grace. Nine times God dealt with them before the tenth plague, uh, showing them grace, showing them grace, showing them grace. Uh, even in that, there was a grace uh, being extended. But on that day in Revelation 14, the Bible says that the same uh, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, uh, which is poured out without mixture into the cup uh, of His indignation. There is coming a day when God uh, is going to have His field uh, of unrighteousness, of wickedness, of ungodliness. Uh, and the Bible says the wrath uh, of God is going to be poured out without mixture there will be no grace there will be no mercy amen this world is headed for that judgment folks amen and we've got to wake up and to realize that the day of grace is coming to an end amen if the Lord is dealing with your heart this morning I would resist the Holy Ghost I wouldn't grieve the Holy Ghost of God oh but I would take him up on his offer of grace I would take him up on his offer of love and of mercy. The Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You're either going to bow your knee and confess Him now in grace and in mercy or you're going to bow your knee to Him in judgment and confess Him that despite, amen, the wickedness of my heart, He's still God and He is good. And then I feel, folks, this is the most sober message. I wish that for about 45 minutes I could get on the airwaves of CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, not to put a spotlight on me, but to put a spotlight on the message and the word of God. I'm telling you, folks, judgment is coming. Judgment is going to befall this world. And judgment is at the door. My God, we've got to realize the end of this thing is upon us. Day is swiftly passing. The night is soon to come. My God, and judgment is imminent. You can see the parallels. But can I tell you something? There was one way of escape in Exodus. And can I tell you, it's still the way of escape for you and I today. Hallelujah. The answer is still the Lamb. Hallelujah. The answer is still the Lamb. Amen. The judgment was coming. It was inevitable. They couldn't stop it. It was nothing the Egyptians could do. They had spurned the grace of God. Judgment was coming. But the Lord said for my people. 
He started talking to Moses. God will do nothing, his word says, unless he first reveals it to his prophets. He's going to do nothing. He began dealing with that man, Moses. He said, son, he said, you get my people ready. He gave them some specific things that they had to do, six things that they had to do. Number one, the first thing is they had to take the lamb. He said, speaking to all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. He gave them specific characteristics that the lamb should have and that it should be a lamb of the first year and it shall be without blemish. It's not to have a handicap. It's not to have a deformity. It's not to have uh, anything wrong with it. Uh, it's to be pure. It's to be spotless. Uh, amen. It's to be white. Uh, it, it's not to be spotted with the things of this world. Uh, amen. And he said, you're to take uh, that lamb. Pick out uh, the lamb uh, to, uh, to, to, to take it up. That word to take in the Hebrew means uh, to accept. Uh, amen. You are to accept the lamb. Uh, amen. You're to take him. Uh, amen. If I can tell you, folks, if you want to escape the judgment uh, that's coming to this world, you must uh, accept the lamb. Hallelujah. You must take the lamb. That lamb was more than a four-legged creature that produced wool and bleated. Amen. But that lamb was a representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout Scripture, the Lamb of God, amen, the, the, the Son of God was represented in that Old Testament by the lamb. Hallelujah. And uh, God told Moses, he said, you're to take out the lamb. You're to pick out the lamb. Hallelujah. Amen. The lamb, folks, is still the answer. The lamb is the answer. If you want to escape the judgment to come, you must accept the lamb. It was John that said in John 1 29, he saw Jesus and said, Behold, the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That word behold means to see, to pay attention to, or to know. John was preaching to a bunch of people that was looking for a Messiah that would fix the political kingdom of their day. I could preach a while right there. They were looking for a silver-tongued politician that would come to make their taxes a little bit lighter, that would make their burdens a little bit better. They were looking for somebody that would make their life easy and better. But John looked to those people of the day and said, you're looking for the wrong thing. Hallelujah. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You're looking for the right thing in the wrong places. But can I tell you, the right thing is here. There's so many people in America today, amen, that's going to miss the second coming of Christ because they're looking for a politician to make their taxes a little lighter and their load a little bit easier to make their life a little bit better in the here and now when their eyes should be fastened on the land. I can tell you the message of the hour is still behold the Lamb of God get your eyes off the debate get your eyes off of the political theater and get your eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ Jesus is still the answer the Lamb of God is still the answer you must accept the Lamb notice the words here Got to hurry this morning. He said, when you pick out the lamb, when you accept the lamb, he said, if the household be too little for the lamb, let him come together with his neighbor according to the size of the people, according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make account for the lamb. Notice he didn't say that if the house is too big for the lamb. Come on, brother. Amen. Yes. Can I tell you, the lamb is always big enough for the house. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. The lamb of God is bigger than your problems. The lamb of God is bigger than your circumstance. The lamb of God is bigger than your dilemma. 
The Lamb of God is bigger than your diagnosis. The Lamb of God is bigger than your calamity. The Lamb of God is big enough to fix your problems. He's big enough to fix your mess. He's big enough to change your circumstances. My God, it didn't say if the house was too big for the Lamb. He said if the house was too little for the Lamb. Because the Lamb is bigger than me. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than all of us. He's greater. Amen. Than any force. He's greater than anything. And I can stand flat footed and tell you today that the Lamb is still big enough. There's too much to preach here. Amen. If the house be too little for the Lamb, the Lamb's always big enough for the house. I mean, not only do they have to accept the Lamb, but the Lamb had to become personal to them. He told them, he said, in the tenth day of the month shall you take for every man a lamb according to the house of the lambs of father, their father. Verse 6 says, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. For four days after they accepted the lamb, that lamb became personal to them. That lamb was on the inside of the house. That lamb wasn't just a red-headed stepchild, but that lamb became personal to him. Got to move on there. A lot of people have animals in the house. We got one. It don't mean that Brother Corey likes it. Not against anybody that does. I love my wife and my kids. They love the dog sometimes, I think, as much, if not more than me. <laughs> they name it. They pet it. I found out recently, did you know that you can take out insurance policies on your dog? My mind was blown. Folks, that's how we should be treating the lamb. There are so many people that treat their dogs great and have no regard for the lamb. I told you I was going to get myself in trouble. I got to move on. But folks, the lamb has to become personal. That lamb lived in their house. They kept it. Amen. For four days. For some, it ate at their table. For some, it, it slept in their, 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 their living quarters. Uh, that lamb didn't venture out. Uh, it, it became personal to that family. Folks, it's one thing to behold the lamb, uh, and it's something else altogether different uh, for that lamb to become personal to you. Hey, Amen. I can tell you there's a lot of people in this world that know about Jesus, uh, but they don't know Jesus. Amen. I was in a service recently. Amen. On that pew. God help me this morning. Amen. Two homosexuals married to one another. In that church service, one of them had their hands lifted up. What were they doing? They were lifting their hands to a God that they don't know. Yeah. Come on. Amen. How do you know that? Amen. Because they would leave that sin and that ungodly lifestyle the same way that an alcoholic, if he knew God, would leave the bottle. The same way that an addict, if they knew God, they would leave that addiction. Amen. I'm not against stoning homosexuals, but I am saying, amen, if you lift up your hands to worship God, you're worshiping a God that you don't know. Amen. Because if you know Him, you're going to forsake the sin. You're going to forsake the lifestyle. The same thing can be said said about two heterosexuals uh, living outside the bounds of marriage. Uh, amen. Living in sin and fornication. Uh, there's a lot of people that's trying to worship a God uh, that they don't know. Uh, they know about God. Uh, they know about some characteristics. Uh, but he's never become personal to him. Uh, oh my God. Uh, he's become, uh, amen, a figure in their life. Uh, but he's never become the God uh, of that life. God help us. Uh, amen. The Lamb uh, must become personal to us. Uh, he must become more than an object in history. He must become more than a prophet. He must become more than a preacher, but he must be Lord. He must be Redeemer. He must be Savior, or he will not be Lord at all. It's one thing to behold the Lamb, it's something altogether different for that Lamb to become personal. That word no, the Greek word no, to know intimately. 
Listen, Jesus must first become personal before he can ever become powerful. He must become personal in you before he can ever do anything powerful in you. Oh, God help us. The Apostle Paul, if anybody knew God, in Philippians 3.10, he wrote that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. If anybody knew the Apostle Paul, and if anybody knew God, I think it would be Paul. Paul saw him on the Damascus Road. He heard his voice, and he talked to him. Paul was led by the Spirit. Paul wrote 13, possibly 14 New Testament books of the Bible. But you take all that Paul knew, and he wrote to the church. He said in Philippians, I still don't know him. I know him, Brother Daniel. But there's still some things I don't know about him. I know who God is. I know what he does. I know what he's doing in me. But there's still some things yet I've got to learn. Paul said that I may know him. That I might know him. I, 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 he, he knew a lot. But he said there's still some things that I've got to learn about this God this morning. And as I was praying, God made this scripture so real to my heart. Because I've come to the exact same place. This morning with tears in my eyes, I said, God, in 20 years of being born again, in 18 years of preaching this gospel, I know you. But Lord, there's still some things I've got to know about you. I, I know him. I know his voice. My sheep know my voice and another they will not follow. I know the voice of God. But I can tell you folks, as much as I know about God, there's still infinitely more that I've got to learn. Amen. As much as I know about Him, amen, there's still characteristics, there's still His nature, amen, that I have not conformed yet to. But it's the work and the progressiveness of the Spirit that as I walk with Him, I'm going to learn more about Him. The more I walk with him, the more I talk with him, the more there is to learn. I, I've been married to my wife. I, amen. In just a couple of weeks will be 11 wonderful, blissful years. Hallelujah. And I'm still learning things about her I never knew before. And every husband said amen. amen. And every wife says amen about their husband. Amen. We're still learning. Every test, every trial. We don't fight, but every intense moment of fellowship that we have, one with another, <laughs> we learn things about each other. Right. Told a man one time, Brother Ed Wilson, he came to the church. We had just been married a couple months. He said, well, have you had your first fight yet? I said, no, sir, not yet. He said, you mean y'all hadn't fought yet? I said, no, sir, not a bit. I said, when I was fighting in school, I never counted the fights that I lost. So therefore, with that same <laughs> equation, I hadn't had a fight yet because I hadn't won one of them. Hallelujah. <laughs> but in every moment, we learn, I can tell you folks, it's the same thing about this Christ. The more you walk with him, the more that you know it, my God. Amen, folks. Amen. We, the Lamb must become personal to us to where we learn more about Him. He wrote to the same Ephesians. He told them in Ephesians 4, verse 20, but ye have not learned Christ. Why? Amen. Because they were still living in sin. They were still living in wickedness. They were still living in fornication. They were still lying. They were still angry, fighting. They were still cussing. Amen. They were grieving the Holy Ghost. They had bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil spirit. Speaking, uh, malice, uh, amen. All of these characteristics, he said, should not uh, be named among you. He said, if you continue on uh, in these things, uh, you have not learned Christ. Uh, you know about him, but you don't know him personally. Uh, oh, you know, uh, have a head knowledge about him, uh, but he's never become the Lord uh, of that heart. I can tell you, folks, if you're, uh, you and I are going to escape the judgment that is to come, uh, we must not only know about the Lamb, uh, we must know the Lamb. Uh, he he must become personal to us. He must be the Lord of all or he will not be the Lord at all. Can you say amen? amen. They had to take the lamb to accept him. They had to make him personal. But then there come the time when that lamb had to be slain. 
You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Folks, we know that this is a representation of Calvary. Where the Lamb of God was slain. Amen. It says in Revelation 13 and 8 that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Amen. I can tell you, folks, if we're going to escape the judgment, uh, amen, the Lamb, uh, amen, we, we, we must, uh, amen, take on uh, the finished work of Calvary uh, to where there is no other answer at this moment in time. Uh, amen. They were saying all of our hope uh, of survival is in the Lamb. Right. Hallelujah. They were saying that, that if we're going to survive the judgment that is to come, uh, everything, uh, all of our future depends on the Lamb. Our past is irrelevant. What we were yesterday is irrelevant. But with the blood of this Lamb, this is going to be, amen, our saving grace. All of their energy, all of their efforts, all of their hope was put into this Lamb. And to that Lamb being slain, I can tell you, Calvary, folks, is still the answer for the world today. There is no other way outside of the shed blood of the Lamb of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know Oprah says... There's many ways to heaven and there's many ways to God. But I submit to you, there is but one way. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no hope outside of His blood. There is no help outside of His blood. He was slain once and for all. My God, for the sins of the whole world, all of our hope must be in the Lamb. No other way. That lamb had to be slain, which points to Calvary. And then they had to take the blood of that lamb and they had to cover it on the doorpost of that house. In other words, when they were striking, taking that hyssop and dipping it into the blood, putting it on the two side posts and the upper doorpost of the house, they were saying, my house is covered by the blood of the Lamb. Yes, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Judgment is coming. We can't do anything to stop it. Right. Something's about to grip the world. We know nothing about. We've never seen anything like this before. We don't know what to do. We just know that we're covered by the blood. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 My God. I don't know what's going to happen in this world. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what news we could get today that could shake us to this core, to our core and bring us to our knees. But I do know this. I'm covered by the blood. Hallelujah. I've been covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not covered with the blood of bulls and of goats and of the, 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 the or sprinkling of a heifer's ashes. I've been washed and purged by something much greater. Amen. Something much more pure. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ it still reaches to the highest mountain. It still flows to the lowest valley. And that blood will never lose its power. I've been covered by the blood. I've been covered by His grace. I've been covered by His mercy. My God, I've been sealed by His blood. The answer for that house was the blood. When the death angel came, he was looking for one thing and one thing only. He was looking for the blood. If that blood was on the doorpost of that house, he passed over it. blood wasn't on that door the firstborn of that house was instantly killed as the act of the judgment of God as it was passing through the land of Egypt it wasn't looking for whether they were Republican or Democrat whether they were Green Party or Independents whether they were Capitalist or Communist whether they were Liberal or Conservative whether they were rich or poor whether they were black and white Hispanic Amen or Fijian, it didn't matter. He was looking for the blood. My God. 
He was looking for the blood. I can tell you folks, it don't matter in this life whether you're white or black, rich or poor. Amen. It only matters. Do you have the blood? Have you been washed by the blood? It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ covering your life. Because I can tell you when God looks down through the through his throne room down to you and I, he's looking for one thing, and that is the blood of his son. Hallelujah. When he looks at me, he don't see my past. He don't see what I was. He sees the blood of his son. My God, and he knows he's mine, she's mine, they're mine, they've been marked and covered by the blood of his son. That's the only thing that matters in this life. Are you covered by the blood? Looking for one thing. Was that half covered now? We have the hindsight of looking back in history. I've got to hurry this morning. We know that it would have been foolish for them not to cover their doorposts of their houses with the blood. Because we have the benefit of history looking back. But put yourself in their shoes in that day. Don't you think this command was a little bit foolish? In the world's eyes, don't you think it's a little bit crazy? You're to take a lamb. You're to kill it. You're to slit its throat. You're to get hyssop, straw, Put it in that blood and put it on the doorpost of your house. Think about if some preacher came to you telling you to do that today. You might scratch your head just a little bit. Because that is not a common occurrence. There were some people that were skeptics and probably doubters then. There were some that probably thought this is a little bit outlandish and crazy. The same way that they think that a preacher preaching a bloody gospel on the blood of Jesus is a little bit fanatical, a little bit crazy, that cuts against the grain of society. Men, that doesn't really sit well in the mainstream. You can think it's crazy if you want to, but there were two camps in that day, one that applied the blood and those that didn't. The group that were saved and the group that experienced the judgment. Those that experienced grace and those uh, that had to bury. Amen. That firstborn child. Uh, amen. There's a lot of people that says today that this blood, uh, uh, you, you preach a bloody gospel. Uh, amen. No, oh, I preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and I put my faith in uh, his shed blood. Uh, amen. To the world, it might be foolish, uh, but the Bible says to them, uh, the preacher of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, uh, but to us that are saved, uh, it is the power of God. Uh, you may look at me and think I'm crazy. Uh, amen. Uh, but I can tell you, folks, uh, it may be foolish to them. Uh, it's not foolish to God. God, uh, the preaching of the cross to them that perish, uh, it is full, uh, foolishness, uh, but to us, uh, it is the power of God. Uh, amen. Folks, nothing else matters in this life but the blood. Uh, if you don't have the blood of Jesus, uh, then you have nothing. Uh, but if you have the blood, uh, you have the key to everything. Uh, the blood uh, is the foundation of it all. Uh, hallelujah. The life uh, of the flesh is in the blood. Uh, thank God for the blood that gives life. Uh, Thank God for the blood that gives salvation. The only answer this morning for judgment is the blood. When they struck the doorpost of that house, they had a command. Whatever you do, stay in the house. Once that blood is applied, don't go outside. Looking around, peeking at what's going on. Don't let curiosity get the best of you. When hurricanes come, I'm the, I'm the crazy one. I like to go outside and just see how bad it is. Come on, brother. I like to peek around and see. Yeah, yeah. Did that limb really just blow by that window? Is that rain really falling as hard, hard as it looks? See, there's times when curiosity gets the best of us. Come on, bro. Mm-hmm. But on that night, yeah. Come on. don't let your curiosity get the best of you. Right. You get in the house and you stay in the house. Right. You shut that door and no matter what goes on out there, don't ever come out. Right. Amen. You stay there. 
You stay there until the morning. Hallelujah. Amen, folks. I can tell you, it's not time to play church. It's not time to be like the chicken to cross the road. Amen. To see what's on the other side. Amen, folks. It's time to get in the house and stay in the house. It's time to get born again, hallelujah, and stay in the house. Amen. It's time to sell out, to quit playing games, to quit, amen, having one foot in the world and one foot in church. And depending on what group you're around, amen, you're hopping and skipping with the best of both of them. I can tell you that's not being born again. That's being foolish. Hallelujah. You don't play around with the blood. You don't play around with the commandments of God. There is judgment coming to this world. And the only only means of salvation are those that are in the house covered by the blood. Hallelujah. Don't come out. Stay in the house. It's time to get in or get out. It's time to sell out to God. Amen. It's time to give God your everything. Third, we can see from this passage of Scripture. Amen. While the destroyer had his reign over all of the land, Brother Joey, it could not cross the bloodline. If you don't shout, I am. Amen. We have a destroyer out that's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I've come to tell you, he can't cross the bloodline. Hallelujah. He can't cross the bloodline. Hallelujah. He may tempt and he may try. But every destroyer has its boundaries. And the blood of Jesus Christ is its boundary. It can't touch what the blood, amen, says he can't touch. He can't do what the blood says he can't do. Hallelujah. I'm today, I'm sealed from the judgment to come because I'm covered by the blood. I don't have to worry about what's coming down the road. Hallelujah. The blood has covered me. But also with spiritual tests and trials on this side of judgment, yes, I have an adversary. Yes, I have a devil. And yes, at times he does try to wear me out. But he can't cross the blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He can only go so far. And Jesus says, that is enough. The destroyer could cross everywhere and touch everybody except those that were covered by the blood. Next thing we see is that the lamb had to be eaten. He says, you take the lamb, you roast it. You don't boil it. You don't eat it raw. But you take the lamb and you eat it. Yeah. Hallelujah. You say, I, when I saw this, I said, okay, I see the typology and everything but to this. Because that sounds pretty out there to be eating Jesus. That lamb represents Jesus. You're boiling, burning him with fire, and you tell me, I get everything else but right here. But Jesus said this in John chapter 6. Come on, come on. The second that my, my mind went there for a nanosecond, how does Jesus apply to eating him? Jesus said this in John chapter number 6. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Amen. It is not physically possible for us to eat Christ. And we are not Catholic that believes in transliteration. That when we partake of the wafers in communion, that it actually becomes the body of Jesus. And when we drink of the wine, it actually becomes the blood of Jesus. No, what we do is in symbol and in type of the flesh and of the body. Amen, folks, there is. Amen, you can look at those wafers and you can look at that grape juice or that wine all day long and you can stare at it throughout all of eternity. I don't want to overturn anybody's apple cart. Amen, but you do need to know that is not the body and that is not the blood. We are observing what Jesus Christ did on Calvary. And he said, take and eat of this. This is my body. Drink of this. This is my blood. Physically speaking, we cannot eat of Christ. But spiritually speaking, we are to be filled with Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. We are to partake of him. To eat of him. He said, the Lord's prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. What is daily bread, folks? It's Christ. It's Jesus. Hallelujah. That Passover meal, not only was there a 
lamb, but there was unleavened bread. Both of those are a type and symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I can tell you, folks, over the last 20 years, every time I get in that book, I'm partaking of Christ. Every time I get in that prayer closet, amen, I'm feasting and fellowshipping with Him. Amen, folks, we must eat of that body. We must partake of Christ. Amen. This world is trying to fill you with everything else. It's time that we feel ourselves full of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Last thing, I've got to hurry, Kirsten, if you help me, I'm done. While eating that lamb, Jesus, or the, God told him, he said, when you eat it, eat it with your loins girded, shoes on your feet, staff in your hand, and he gave him one final command. Eat it in haste. Which means with excessive speed or a sense of urgency. What he was saying, eat all you can while you can. Judgment is coming. You better get full while you can. You fast forward it throughout the thousands of years to where we are in present day. Judgment is at the door. You better eat all you can while you can. Partake it and eat it all in haste. And not only are you to eat it in haste, but your loins are to be girded. They have wore long flowing robes in that day that would go down to the ankles. And if they were about to go on to a journey, if they were to have to go somewhere in a hurry, they would take that robe and fold it up. And they would tie it around their waist. To where it would hang down, it wouldn't be immodest, but they would be able to walk much faster when their loins were girded. Amen. They would be able to, 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 to leave with a faster sense of urgency. Amen. Because that robe wouldn't trip them up. Amen, folks. Amen. We've got to know. Amen. That Jesus is coming. Yeah. Our loins must be girded. Right. Amen. We must be ready. At a moment's notice to get out of here. He said, have your loins girded. Have shoes on your feet. There's a journey that's yet to go on. Amen. Don't be barefooted. Amen. Don't try to walk it on yourself and put shoes on your feet. And by the way, these were the same shoes that never wore out. Folks, these were supernatural shoes touched by the hand of Almighty God. As much as they wondered, those shoes never wore out. He said, and have the staff in your hand. I've preached this many times before. The bears repeating very quick. They didn't have paper and pencil and Facebook and Mac computers to write down testimonies and genealogies in, in these days. But what they did have was a knife or a sharp stick and a staff. Yeah. And if anything of importance happened in their life, they would carve out a figure in that staff. And they would tell it to their descendants. On this day... I was out and such and such happened or God performed this miracle or God did that. And they would orally tell it to the next generation when they died. They would pass that staff down from generation to generation. And that was a trail of history of all the acts and the miracles of God. Amen. What he was saying, have your testimony in your hand. You don't know what's going to happen down the road. You don't know what you're going to face or what you're going to go through. But have this testimony in your hand that if I did it yesterday, I'm fully capable of doing it tomorrow. And whatever you need in your life, I am a God that is sufficient. I'm greater than the gods of Egypt. I'm greater than all the gods of Pharaoh. And if I'm greater than them, I will take care of you. Have your staff. Have that testimony in your hand so you never forget Get the goodness of God. Amen. Shoes on your feet. Lawns girded. Testimony in your hand. You're about to get out of here. I'm going to lead you to the promised land. Folks, you hear me. You hear me. This world is headed to a day of wrath. To days of wrath. But the church, we're headed to the day of rapture. Hallelujah. I don't have to worry about the judgment of God that's going to befall this land because I've got the blood. The blood of Jesus has covered me. But if you're here and you're lost, you're watching my way of live stream. What I'm preaching about is foreign to you this morning. Amen. It don't have to be. 
It is something that every man, woman, boy, and girl must, must have an encounter with the blood and must be washed and purged by the blood because the answer, folks, is still the lamb. The end is contained or found in the beginning. The same way in typology, Moses' deliverance from the children of Israel is the same mode and means of deliverance for the church of the living God. Judgment is coming. But as a matter of fact, folks, the judgment that's going to befall this world is going to make Pharaoh's plagues look like a walk in the park. There's going to be seven bowls. There's going to be seven trumpets. There's going to be seven vials. Amen. That's going to be poured out on this world without mixture, without mercy, without grace. The world never has nor will ever see anything like it again. But you and I, the blood bought and the redeemed, while this world's in judgment, you and I are going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You and I, hey amen, we're going to be getting our horses ready because we're about to come back. We're going to rule and reign with Christ. If you're not born again, judgment is at your doorstep. And I say that not laughing at laughing nature. Judgment is going to befall this world. It breaks my heart. But what gives me joy is to know the church is about to get out of here. And the church is about to go home. Hallelujah. Folks, we're about to get out of here. And we're about to go. You better make sure, amen, that you've taken the lamb. You better make sure that he's become personal to you. You better make sure that you put your faith and your trust in the finished work of Calvary. You better make sure that His blood is above your heart. You better eat as much of the lamb as you can while you can. And it's time to make your preparation, your calling, and your election sure. Learn, get your girt, or learn about your loins. Amen. Get your shoes on your feet. Get your staff in your hand. We're about to get out of here and we're going home. We're not going to the land of Canaan that's still got giants and still has enemies to conquer. We're going to heaven uh, with streets of gold uh, walls of jasper uh, gates of pearl uh, where Jesus is uh, we're about uh, to go home the lamb is still the answer stand all over the building I'm done this morning Father I love you I pray oh God do the work that only you can do touch the heart I can touch amen you're here this morning you say I'm lost preacher I need to be saved I need to have an encounter with the blood I need the blood of Jesus. Amen. To cleanse me, to wash me, to forgive me. Amen. Very quickly. Right where you are. Slip up your hand. God knows. God sees. You can't preach like this without giving people an invitation and an opportunity to know this God. Amen. God sees and God knows. Yes. Amen. You may be watching by way of live stream. You can't get to this physical location right where you are. Kneel down. Cry out to Jesus. Put your faith in that blood. Let Him wash you. Let Him cleanse you. Amen. Maybe you're here and you say, Amen, I'm growing stagnant in my walk with God because I've not really partook of the Lamb and fellowship like I should. I need to, amen, fill myself up with Christ. There's no better opportunity or day than today. Amen. To get as much of God as you can while you can. Or you may be here and you may say, I'm, I'm saved. I've been covered by the blood, but I've got my eyes off of the main thing. I put it on other things, and I need to make sure that my loins are girded. I need to make sure that my shoes are on my feet. I, I need to make sure that my staff is in my hand and to make sure that I'm ready to go. Amen. I don't know where you may be today in your walk, what spectrum or end of the spectrum you may be in. Amen. But there's no day like today to get in this altar, get on that you can of God. Let's come to this altar this morning. Amen. God knows. God sees right where you are. He knows right what you need. Hallelujah. Let's cry out to Him. Let's cry out to the Lamb. Amen. Let's cry out to the Lamb. Oh, my God, my God. Let's partake of the Lamb.